This series is on simulating fluid flow effectively. Look at it, the vast amounts of flow details back for a cost-effective representation. And we have made great progress so far. Starting at the very bottom with quantum mechanics, we learned to employ many layers of abstraction to the problem, and modeling simplifications popped up in an almost natural way. So we not only reduced information, but we got confident in thinking statistically and quickly figured it is indeed possible to sacrifice needless information while keeping the global picture mostly intact. And as we kept looking through a more statistical lens, an incredible tool fell into our hands. In its core, molecule motion is averaged into a probability field of matter derived just right to match to the collective behavior of the underlying particles. We built a continuous macroscopic perspective. In fact, two versions of it. And here we are, having continuous fields of information as artificial representations of real fluids. Complemented by laws of motion, they track initial to future flow states, exactly what we aim to know. But strangely enough, although the macroscopic perspectives are derived under restricting assumptions and therefore reduced in their capabilities, they nonetheless contain an infinite amount of information. Each and every point in these fields comes with its unique set of values. So this may not look like progress at all considering the information density of these models, then how do we process this infinity of values to begin with? And that's why in the upcoming parts we take the reduction scheme one step further, rephrasing the problem and making all of this computationally tractable. My hope and goal here is to let you appreciate that by using these blurred representations we actually gain much more freedom in subsequent reducibility. You will see, the continuous perspective on matter is an excellent starting point for a tremendous information reduction further down the fluid and it will prove to be a worthwhile step towards large-scale simulations. Alright, let's continue. To start out, let's recap the playgrounds for this video, the continuous fields. By superimposing multiple particle simulations, we derived a probabilistic representation evolving in the space of positions and velocities, visualized here by their magnitudes, the speeds. And this representation rendered highly flexible in describing a whole range of flow conditions, including extreme rarefaction or extremely high speeds. But such a flexible probability distribution is not always needed. In this single simulation, the particles are distributed along positions and velocities too, but the local speed distribution exhibits a distinct kind of shape, the local equilibrium distribution. This shape itself may be shifted or stretched, but these characteristics can be expressed using dedicated quantities such as temperature or flow velocity. So for local equilibria, the probability field in position velocity space was condensed to multiple fields of such quantities purely in position space, a second type of continuous representation if you will. Now while both variants have their benefits in representing different flows, they share some similarities when it comes to mathematical treatment. Both have evolution equations dictating the change of the fields as time passes by, both can be derived for a bunch of different gases or liquids manifesting in modifications to these equations and ultimately both leave no trace they ever represented particles. The particle-based origin of these fields is interesting and should not be forgotten, but the individual particles no longer participate in these models anymore. For instance, the continuous position space field here retains no notion of its size relative to the particles. Even if our field is meant to be interpreted from a macroscopic perspective, assuming local equilibrium, nonetheless given the right excitation the equations allow for continuous motion at all length scales. Mathematically there is no smallest limit and the model could operate in quite an abstract way. Of course we wouldn't intentionally misuse the model, but as we will see we only have so much control over the local flow structure sizes emerging in the fields. The point is, the continuous fields indeed contain the potential to store an infinite amount of distinct information, not just smooth out large-scale fluid portions. When left alone again, the fields tend to smooth out on their own, but a possible arbitrary structuredness must be kept in mind. Now to narrow the subsequent derivations, we focus on the position space model called a continuum, even though many ideas work for both approaches. And a short schedule. This part in particular focuses on better understanding continuous motion in general and preparing it for the later numerical treatment. 
There's a tricky portion of motion description and problem rephrasing ahead of us to make sure we tackle the right problem. And to get a better feeling for continuous motion in general, let's look at this little fluid portion in a two-dimensional box. Each fluid point carries a set of values ranging from velocity components in x or y direction to temperature or pressure for instance. Upon evaluating all evolution equations simultaneously at each point, these values will be updated and with time, new configurations establish. The fields evolve in a continuous fashion, meaning there will always be these fluid fields and no gaps arise. Now this continuous average look at the molecular motion implies a convenient side effect. Points that are initially close to each other will stay close for a certain period of time. And in the limit case of infinitely closely located points, they stay close forever. The continuous motion is thus amenable to a convenient mathematical treatment, which can be seen from an archetype of an evolution equation. Often a rate of change of some field quantities, such as velocity, can be related to changes of further field quantities along the spatial directions of the fields. Points talk to each other to move compliantly. So at any one of these fluid points, we need to evaluate derivatives along space and time. And since we already saw the locally similar and smooth motion of the two points, we know that the field values and so their derivatives leading up to this motion will also be locally similar. And in the long run, this local similarity is the key to justify approximating the field evolution equations using clever guesses and therefore to reduce information. A first step in thinking discretized. But before we dive into reduction methods, we should develop the right language to describe field evolutions in an intuitive and practical way, illustrated here for the velocity information. Now, I think it is safe to say that intuitively you would likely track individual fluid points to describe motion. And this intuition is in line with Newton's second law of motion, which is evaluated along with the moving matter. A tiny fluid volume, a parcel, is pushed around according to the net force it sees by moving along its trajectory. From this force, a rate of change of the particle's velocity, its acceleration is determined, leading to iteratively updated velocities and positions, as we have seen in previous parts. Basically, the velocity vector keeps getting manipulated in the direction of the acceleration vector, with both of them existing purely within flat time slices. The temporal dimension is here simply drawn to highlight the space and time nature of the continuum evolution. It is not part of these vectors and their derivatives, and so there is an angle to be seen between the parcel's time-space trajectory and the velocity vector. And focus specifically on the nature of the acceleration shown here. It encodes changes of the fluid velocity vector as it evolves along consecutive locations that happen to follow the parcel trajectory. Now while this is a very intuitive way of describing motion, maybe there are different perspectives on fluids that turn out to be helpful. It's always good to have an overview of what is possible and then pick the option that makes the most sense. So let's draw an alternative set of consecutive locations which intentionally does not follow any particular fluid trajectory. Along this curve, we can also read off the underlying field values and therefore we see a rate of change of these field values as seen along the curve itself. Tracking, for instance, velocities at the locations of this line, their rates of change will also have units of acceleration. We have a change of velocities and a change in time, but it has a different meaning. Look closely. The velocities along this line are those of different fluid points that happen to pass this line at these very moments. So rather than tracking velocity changes while following a parcel trajectory, we are tracking interparser velocity changes that can be seen along an arbitrary chosen path. These are different things. And please note, even though the evaluation point seemingly moves along a curve, at each moment of reading the velocity data, the point or probe is here considered stationary and simply detects the underlying flow velocity at that point, not the relative velocity between the probe velocity and the flow velocity. So up to now these curves are meant to provide the where and when to simply extract the underlying field values. Now back to the curve versus trajectory perspective. Note specifically in this region here, the velocity vector of the passing parcel turns to the right, but the vector along the arbitrary curve turns to the left, leading to different accelerations, despite intersecting at a certain point. So while passing the same point, the curves along we do so embody different statements. If the curve follows a trajectory, the acceleration is as seen as from a moving parcel used in Newton's laws of motion. 
If the curve does not follow a trajectory, the acceleration is just an arbitrary combination of velocity field values. In an even broader sense, you could take any two velocity vectors in space and time and bake a quantity with the unit's acceleration, yet no fluid point is obliged to experience this particular value as its acceleration. So despite having the same units, these quantities mean different things. Then why should we even think about such arbitrary curves if their meaning does not align with the laws of motion? Well, the curves put us in the position to express how we want to describe the fluid motion independent of what the fluid itself does. We are no longer forced to think and follow along the fluid flow, which is an inherently unstructured way to capture fluid motion. For instance, by using spatially fixed lines through space and time, we may not track individual parcels anymore, but we nonetheless get a good idea of what's happening within the fluid, and such a structured perspective may be beneficial. But to get this going and to compute these spatially fixed evolutions, we need to modify the trajectory-wise velocity evolution law so that it talks to us in terms of rates of changes of velocity as seen at a fixed site. So we really need to express the trajectory-wise acceleration term by the spatially fixed acceleration term plus some corrections. Luckily, in a previous part we already noted, within super small regions of the continuum, field values vary linearly. And for simplicity we focus on the velocity evolution along a single spatial direction and the time direction here. It's easier to visualize and the message is the same. Also note, as position and velocity vectors have the same number of entries, the velocity vectors are drawn within each time slice here. They are intended to recreate a position difference upon multiplication with the time difference. The shift from time slice to time slice itself has its own speed and is not contained in the velocity vector. Now the linear variation allows writing this velocity field as a superposition of a mean velocity field plus individual velocity deviations along each direction of space and time. So as a parcel shifts by a tiny little bit, the total change in velocity it experiences is linked to the superimposed individual contributions. Due to the linearity within the supersmall region, each of these contributions itself is in fact given by a linear term. Writing this expression per time links the total rate of change of velocity valid along a trajectory to the rate of change of velocity at a fixed location while also introducing shifting rates along each individual direction. For the spatial directions, these rates are simply the velocity components and for the time direction, well, time surely goes in time direction at a certain rate, leaving us with this little tool, the material derivative. And with this link, the velocity evolution is now adapted to be used along our fixed locations. It really tells us how the velocity seen at fixed sites evolve. As you can see, evaluation curves and evolution law finally align. Now, following the idea of using arbitrary curves, the fixed or trajectory form of looking at fluids appear as special cases of a more general, arbitrary form, and we may use either of these depending on the problem at hand. And there is one particularity I'd like to focus on now. Given we aim to evolve a parcel trajectory through space and time using the tools presented so far, irrespective of employing the trajectory fixed or arbitrary perspective, all of these formulations evolve the whole velocity field and so provide a velocity vector at the current parcel location that it should follow to generate the trajectory. And this is crucial. Even if we use the formulation with the derivatives along with the flow, we still have to manually shift to new evaluation point coordinates within the underlying fixed coordinate system if we want to keep tracking this particular trajectory. Of course, from all possible directions, the velocity vector basically tells us the next reasonable evaluation point and we better use this recommendation. But figuring out where to go and actually going there are two different operations and parcel tracking requires both. Now this is of course not an issue, we wouldn't question it and simply go there, but separating both components opens the door for an alternative perspective. Because here's the thing. A parcel's physical location is mathematically conveniently captured within a coordinate system and we are free to choose one at will. And for all previously discussed formulations, without mentioning it, we used an underlying spatially fixed coordinate system, represented here by some fixed grid lines with all points to be measured relative to these lines. Now when it comes to parcel tracking, a feasible alternative approach would be observing fixed points within a new coordinate grid that itself deforms with the fluid. These relative scene fixed points then automatically follow parcels per definition. And that's great, but it comes at a cost. 
the computation somehow needs to be done, although now it is the computational grid that is shifted, not points relative to a grid. But isn't this just rephrasing the same thing? Can this approach be of actual value? Let's see how it works out. Remember what all previous formulations had in common. All field quantities were given over the independent variables which are the time and space coordinates within the spatially fixed coordinate system. And these independent coordinates carried over one to one into the evolution equations. So the equations told us for instance how the velocities at a certain location for a certain point in time evolve. And that's why we had to manually shift to track a parcel. Its relevant next velocity vector is located at a shifted point in the fixed coordinate grid. Now if we aim to use a different material-wise fixed coordinate system, we avoid any manual shifting along the new grid, but we should expect a new evolution equation to appear that operates on field quantities given in terms of these new coordinates. But regardless of what the new evolution equation actually looks like, how do we even express the new coordinates in the first place? Still, it looks complicated. Apparently, a fixed point within the new coordinate system uniquely refers to the same material parcel at any time. So to express this material-wise fixed nature, maybe a useful description appears if we think about how to uniquely identify parcels to begin with. And one solution is right in front of us. Think about it. What is fixed and unique along a trajectory of a moving parcel? Its origin, or any other point of it. They inherently give rise to the trajectory, like birthplaces. Therefore, simply call parcels by their spatial coordinates they occupied at some initial time t0. Since there's just one and only one parcel per unique initial location, we have a unique identification for all of time. You are the parcel born at x0, y0 may sound strange, but it's unique. And as all parcels are identified by initial locations and time, the new evolution equation evolves not velocities but future parcel locations, which now appear as the dependent variables. We still need to integrate the time derivative as part of the evolution to get the future locations, but while doing so we do not shift across the computational grid anymore. We refer to the same initial location. This is how the notion of parcel tracking is deeply baked into this approach. So while drawing the independent axis of initial location and time perpendicular to one another, the parcel evolution looks not really familiar anymore. The motion is tracked along a straight line. But with the dependent future locations as well as the material grid drawn within the spatially fixed coordinate system, we clearly see the material-wise fixed nature of this new representation called material coordinates. Again, the exact form of the evolution equation is not important here. But note, while performing the evolution instead of crunching derivatives using fluid parcel neighbors at a future location, well, we aim to talk about the same infinitely closely located neighbors. We want to express the same physical truth, but we also identify them through their initial locations. All of this basically makes the sheet of initial locations our new computational grid for the evolution equation, what at the same time marks a huge drawback. Initially well-structured material grids will soon look scrambled within the original spatially fixed coordinate system as they deform with the fluid. Likewise, spatially fixed grids will deform in a similar fashion when seen from the material coordinate system, so both grids can look fixed or moving depending on the coordinate system we choose for observation. And here's a problem. While both formulations are in principle equivalent, they encode the same physical truth, the numerically discretized treatment that we will explore in the later reduction stage in all its glory introduces a significant computational burden. As a little preview, consider this. Approximating derivatives by local differences using sample points with constant spacing along the material coordinates may look awkwardly stretched as seen from the spatially fixed coordinates. This is a problem. It indicates that a discretized computation of material-wise local differences refers here to spatially non-local and not really meaningful field changes in the first place. You are processing physically irrelevant data. Since the relevant fluid interactions rely on spatial proximity, it is preferable to capture discretized field changes in an equal manner at any time. And that's why our original spatially fixed coordinate system makes actually more sense for fluids. Equidistant local differences along an arbitrary curve within the spatially fixed coordinates may look awkwardly stretched within the material coordinates, but this is irrelevant 
the local differences keep their physical meaning as a measure of spatially local field changes. So any benefits of the material approach can only take full effect if the physical meaning is retained, for instance by adapting the material grid discretization or by limiting the treatment to mild deformations of solids for instance, and that's when we will dive into this approach in much greater detail in a future series. The material, or more generally, arbitrary identification has tremendous potential for lots of useful applications and I had to mention the underlying idea for its fundamental importance and also I needed an excuse to keep drawing these results. In this series we are nonetheless more inclined to use the preferred approach of spatially fixed coordinates to perform either fixed site evaluations or manual parcel tracking. Now that we have an idea how to describe fluid motion mathematically, before we blindly discretize the heck out of the problem, we should pause for a moment and think about the fluid from a more probabilistic and physical point of view. Maybe there are alternative ways of looking at the problem that are easier to solve but still give insight into certain aspects of fluid behavior. So if we take a look at our continuous field, we see that initial strong blasts. Bless you. Those blasts lead in general to rapid motion with many rotating chunks of fluid, which also come in different sizes. Unsurprisingly, even stronger blasts <coughs> provoke even heftier responses. Now as much as I'm wondering why noseless creatures sneeze, I'm also wondering what these blasts imply for our simulation. We already learned that the fields have no limit in representing information. So as we cannot afford infinite resolution, we should either limit the expected smallest curl sizes to guarantee their resolution, or we should represent the aggregated effect of these small flow structures onto the larger resolved flow structures. All of these curls contain energy and mix matter and we cannot simply ignore them. Now looking at this seemingly chaotic fluid motion here, you may remember how we treated chaotic motion of the underlying particles. We used averages. So the same idea may be applicable here too. As we accept it to disregard individual particle information, we implicitly accept that, that microscopically different simulations are encoded by the same macroscopic description. Similarly, we can accept to consider slight random perturbations of the flow field as unrecognizable and therefore differently perturbed fields to be equivalent as well. But even though all these fields here look duplicated, Running the simulations ultimately leads to non-equivalent flow fields, although from a characteristical point of view they likely remain similar. We still see the same range of curl sizes emerging from the same initial blast. But all of this is expected. For the particles we have already seen the accumulating effect of slight initial deviations in action. They quickly explored their own future with some of them even leaving equilibrium temporarily. And so as we average the particle motion of many independent microscopic simulations to define an ensemble average typical evolution, we can similarly ensemble average many independent macroscopic simulations. All of this actually paves the way for yet another set of equations now dictating this averaged evolution. This way you don't solve for any individual simulations anymore, but directly for the averaged outcome with the dominant dynamics still being contained. Following the idea outlined here, we will discuss such averaged evolutions, including turbulence modeling, in greater detail in a future part. This topic is as rich as the dynamics involved and knowing this is the right spot to introduce turbulence modeling is not a bad thing, although we postpone the discussion. So we stay with the original equations and keep resolving all flow structures, which for a desired resolution boils down to a restriction on the blasts and therefore the smallest flow structure sizes. But even using any of the averaging approaches out there, the resolution is a critical parameter limiting the simulation capabilities severely and so it greatly lines up with other assumptions we have made so far. To be clear, making more and more realistic models is extremely interesting and revealing, but breaking things down to minimal, almost abstract models that still get certain aspects right you care about, that also requires insights. Ultimately, all models are nothing but just tools. They are not what really happens, they intentionally predict more or less aspects of reality. Does nature really care about man-made descriptions such as wave functions and various laws of motion? One thing is for sure, these things prove to be useful concepts, why don't we take them for what they are? Just look at the averaged evolution, it is extremely unlikely that a single more realistic simulation ever matches the averaged evolution, yet it will prove to be super useful from an engineering perspective. 
Let's be open-minded and experience the consequences of radical assumptions. Let's embrace the imperfection to really get resource-conscious problem-solving. And when we are done, we don't have just one simulator, but we learn to build all simulators and to pick the right one for the right task. And with that in mind, I think it's the right time to abstract the problem even further. Looking at the fluid model we derived in the previous part, it was conservation of mass, momentum and energy as well as hints on local equilibrium behavior that made such a set of equations plausible. So additional to the momentum equation underlying the previous discussion in this part, there are much more constraints on the actual flow problem and the specific evolution of the dependent variables, velocity, temperature and so on, that simultaneously satisfies all these equations given some boundary and initial conditions basically solves the flow problem, ignoring questions on solution uniqueness for now. From this solution, relevant quantities such as loads on objects can be deduced, so we could actually start solving this problem right away. But that may not be the most cost-effective approach. By inspecting the equations we notice, the number of independent equations and the number of dependent variables are equal, which here roughly means there are right enough relational statements that describe the must-have dependencies between the variables to leave no guesswork when it comes to their evolution. This is again expected. We uncovered these quantities to sufficiently describe the macroscopic state of real fluids. And as these macroscopic quantities apparently evolve with time, we would prefer to have a set of equations describing exactly this evolution, which this set of equations does, and it's great at that. But as the complexity of solving systems of equations scales with this number, we should try to reduce it or at least find other simplifications. But why should it even be possible in the first place? We found these equations for good reasons. Mass, momentum and energy have to be conserved and there will always be these dependent variables, right? Well, written like this, these are still quite general placeholder equations and if you're willing to sacrifice some of this generality, we might get away with a simpler set of equations or even a smaller set if you manage to decouple them. However, that will work. So as it is worthwhile looking for simplifications, let's see what we can do about our fluid equations. And we do so by stating what we do not want to sacrifice and build up from there. Since we will study stationary and non-stationary or transient motion to see how certain flow patterns build up in the first place, the fluid motion is important and velocities must be allowed to take distinct values and the momentum equation describes exactly that, so there is no way around it. Within this equation there are further dependent variables such as density, which has its own evolution equation that in return requires flow velocity as a sole additional input. So straight away we find these two equations go closely hand in hand and we start with dissecting the density equation. Now using the product rule on the second term, we see a strangely familiar face. These two first terms are the material derivative here for density, meaning the rate of change of the density as experienced by a parcel moving along with the flow. So expressing assumptions on density along the flow might involve manipulating this equation. So let's try it. For instance, the air around us is known to be really compressible and our general model accounts for that. Nonetheless, we often face flow problems where the compressibility of the material itself is negligible. This slowly flying wing inside's density changes, but so little the velocity update computed from the momentum equation sees way larger contributions from other causes such as the pressure fluctuation and we can use such insights on the relative strength of those factors in our favor. A little warning here. There are a lot of things to consider when it comes to compressible flow. For an intuitive way to see at least one tiny aspect of it, think about how information is carried throughout the fluid by using this abstract one-dimensional fluid column. A sudden flow velocity disturbance at one location is felt at a different location as the triggered compression wave reaches that point. The wave itself is a natural process, the material relocates to equalize any disturbances, inciting here fluctuations in all microscopic fields. As the fields settle down at one location, the flowing material creates new disturbances further down the fluid. This wave and so the information that something happened moves at a certain speed, which is in general different to the underlying flow speed of the moving matter. Now look what happens when we disturb more slowly. The wave speed is slightly slower, but it becomes relatively seen faster with respect to the underlying much slower disturbed flow speed. Look at it the other way around. By artificially scaling up the slower simulation velocities as well as the playback speed to make the flow speeds match visually, 
we see that the wave speed and so the speed of information gets relatively seen faster and in the limit case it would be infinitely fast. So for relatively slow flow speeds we could assume an instantaneous information redistribution directly. There wouldn't be such compression waves anymore and every fluid point already knows that something is going on. It doesn't need to wait for the relatively fast compression wave to get pushed around anymore. The pressure to make the fluid move accordingly reaches everywhere as needed, right at an instant. This instantaneous compressionless motion has a neat consequence for a volume drawn onto the fluid, assuming unit depth here for unit conformity. As it moves along with the flow, without any local compression, this volume and every other parcel volume must be conserved. And to use this insight for our field equations, we should express such a local volume conservation purely based on field quantities that could influence a volume and therefore the spatial extent, which are the velocities. To find such an expression we should realize that the contained matter in a local volume is also conserved, it makes the material volume in the first place. And so this volume conservation valid for every parcel implies a density field that does not change along with the flow and the material derivative of the density, the derivative along with the flow has to be zero and velocities have to follow this constraint, the constraint for incompressible flow. By enforcing this constraint we override the natural compression wave process leading to volume conservation directly with a conserved surrogate. This filters compression waves but preserves lower distortions and instead of the density evolution equation we have to satisfy this constraint which will prove to be computationally beneficial we don't have to resolve the fast compression waves anymore. Now although the density and so the compression along the flow may not change using this assumption, there is still a consistent pressure field needed to somehow imply this volume conservation by providing the necessary driving forces to push the matter around compliantly. In other words, we could allow for a slight violation of the velocity constraint and then figure out how much pressure is needed to not let that deviation develop in the first place, uh, kind of. This will require special treatment discussed later in this series. Take note, although each parcel keeps its density constant while using the incompressibility constraint, the densities of different parcels may differ. Imagine two interacting portions of matter, not necessarily fluids. A fluid enclosed object moving through space may have a different density than the fluid, yet both portions of matter conserve their volume when treated as incompressible. This surely extends to mixtures of fluids with different densities which can also move volume conservingly. However, the independent and even stronger assumption of a single constant density for all of matter could also be used. Now let's put in perspective what we actually imply by assuming incompressible flow. So far we learned, for less and less incited density fluctuations, the flow field develops in a more and more volume conserving way. Mathematically this reshaped the conservation of mass to a kinematic constraint with pressure being determined to imply the fulfillment of this constraint. Interestingly, even though the pressure intentionally varies along with the flow, the density must not vary per definition and this pressure independent density might be reflected in the equation of state. So bypassing any dependence on pressure variation leaves the temperature variations as a sole dynamical influence on the density. We have seen this for the slowly flying wing. The temperature and density fields were characteristically similar to one another and not so much to whatever the pressure did. But wait, doesn't it contradict in the incompressible limit? You started assuming the density to be constant along with the flow, yet later it is said to follow temperature variations of moving parcels. What is it then? Well, some approaches justify a constant temperature along with the flow, implying a constant density along with the flow and this works fine, but what if we don't want to go that route? And this here is a great opportunity to expand our willingness to make useful assumptions by seeing these approximations as what they are, task related tools. Ever so slightly changes in density may be negligible for one task but can be significant for another one and it's up to us to decide what flow we want to study and what assumptions make sense. When fulfilling the mass and momentum conservation to get the updated volume conserving part of the velocities, the little density changes prove to be insignificant for that task and we would like to keep them out of the problem via enforcing incompressibility. However, for a different task within the same model, these density changes may be essential. In an attempt to understand this, these little guys here spread out heat, which locally increases the temperature. 
The temperature difference makes initially light dense regions to develop a slight pressure difference leading to an expansion of the hotter region and therefore reduces its density. With gravity kicking in the less dense region starts to rise inciting buoyancy driven flow. Now we could use the full compressible model for this type of flow but that comes at much greater cost and a need based refined approach is more desirable. For this particular super weakly compressible flow we rather like to use the computationally faster incompressible formulation as the flow practically conserves volume here. The temperature to pressure density velocity effect chain could then be bypassed by approximately incorporating the final temperature based buoyant effect into the velocity update directly. Even though density changes are essential for this type of flow, an incompressible baseline simulator enriched with a shortcut term is known to be remarkably accurate. And that's the beauty of these assumptions. You have more freedom than you might think, just make your model useful. And the explanation why it's not a contradiction in this case goes something like this. Since this buoyancy driven flow here is so close to the incompressible limit, the actual deviation from that limit case is not really important when it comes to practical volume conservation. All these cases provide good volume conservation and so we can take one first shot of the density field that on top happens to be computationally beneficial, the incompressible case. However, we just take it as a placeholder for every other slight variation giving practically the same volume conserved motion. And so we do not really mean to restrict ourselves to this chosen density field, we just want to almost conserve volume as easy as possible. Once we manage to advance the motion volume conservingly, we can focus on a more refined version of the density field, more important for the buoyancy part of the model. And here's a key insight. This new slightly varying density evolution implied by the temperature still fulfills practical volume conservation. And so it does not contradict the first part of the approximation which really is meant as a statement on practical volume conservation, not any particular choice of the density field establishing it. We just used one magical density field to trigger the incompressible formulation even though we are fine with any other variant. And so the partly insignificance of density variations allowed for a partly sped up computation. That's resource conscious problem solving in action and that's why this approach is so successful. But in any case, we need to know the temperature changes which follow from the energy equation. So do we still need to evolve all equations simultaneously? In some cases yes, but if we justify to ignore the temperature influence on density and therefore buoyancy driven flow and somehow accept a temperature independent viscosity, then the temperature sends no feedback to the momentum equation and the energy equation is actually decoupled from the first two evolution equations and could be solved separately afterwards. The temperature field may still be important to other systems coupled to the fluid to feel this temperature but it doesn't contribute to the dynamical behavior of the fluid itself anymore and its computation reduces to a post-processing step for the a priori solved mass and momentum equations. This is a big deal. We reduce the maximum number of equations to be solved simultaneously. Yay! So as you can see, there's a lot we can do with these equations depending on the goal of the analysis and there's even more to say about all of that, way beyond what this video is supposed to cover. Just take away Right now is the right time to introduce physical insights to simplify the problem. I can only invite you to make your own decisions and I would love to discuss more of it in the future. As mentioned before, the assumptions addressed here often come along with lots of further implications and one has to evaluate with care how plausible these assumptions for the studied flow really are. What remains for now is to ask ourselves, what is our goal? We want to learn to reduce information to uncover the essence of seemingly complex problems, one step at a time. And as we got a glimpse on what it means to simplify the equations, when it comes to numerical treatments in the next parts, it would be beneficial to get along with as few equations as possible for better overview and focus, keeping the option in mind to come back and take more sophisticated models as needed. And that's ahead of us. We intentionally continue with incompressible flow, neglect temperature feedback and aim to solve this little set of equations. We choose this ultra simplified form for better focusing on our upcoming task, the discretization. Before we recap the core ideas of this part, I want to say thank you for supporting my work and making all of this possible. As you can imagine, making these videos requires a lot of work which I love to do. 
Hopefully I could share the joy of thinking about these topics and maybe it helps you a little bit. Without a doubt, your support really helps me making more tasty content for you. My deepest gratitude for that. We started out appreciating continuous fields as the macroscopic average language of storing fluid state information on an infinitely fillable playground. While thinking continuously about these fields, we noticed a certain smoothness and local similarity of the evolution marking the entry point for the later reduction approach. In practice, it was a peculiar combination of coordinates and motion expressed within these coordinates that must match to the physical truths that always hold. And while these truths are factual, we explored alternative, simpler formulations, a subset of what is true, as a next milestone for our journey of reducing information. Thank you for watching and making this possible.